Now, imaging has a long tradition uh, in neurobiology. Going back to Ramon y Cajal, it's really been uh, at the forefront of neurobiological research. Ramon y Cajal perfected the uh, Golgi techniques, which is a method to sparsely label neural tissue, uh, to really come up with the neuro neuron doctrine to, f to figure out that neurons are the elemental building box of brain and that neurons have an output side, the dendrite and an uh, input side, a dendrite and an output side, uh, the axon. Uh, another important technique in neurobiology is uh, fluorescence microscopy, uh, which is, of course, an important tool in other kinds of uh, cell biology. And uh, fluorescence microscopy has high resolution, and it has also uh, incredible selectivity. One only images that which one labels. So here, for example, is a red marker that fills dendrites of this neuron uh, on a recent cover of the journal uh, neuron. And uh, also, uh, a green fluorophore that is tagged or that tags uh, synaptic proteins that you can see as little green puncta along uh, the dendrite of uh, this neuron. But as I've already mentioned, these wide field standard fluorescence microscopy methods cannot be applied uh, to scattering tissues because the scattering reduces the resolution and contrast of these methods as one images uh, deep in scattering tissue. This problem was essentially overcome uh, by two photon excitation microscopy invented uh, about um, 20 years ago now, which is laser scanning microscopy techniques. And I don't have time to explain how it works. Suffice it to say that it brings all of the wonderful advantages of fluorescence microscopy uh, to uh, imaging deep in scattering tissues. So it's a simple uh, laser scanning microscope, but it provides high resolution and contrast when imaging uh, deep in synapses deep in scattering tissue like a brain slice or even in an intact uh, mouse. So the this slide just illustrates the kinds of things you can do uh, when imaging um, in scattering tissues. Uh, two photon excitation microscopy has high resolution, that's illustrated right here, uh, where we've imaged individual axonal terminals uh, over uh, almost 80 days here. Um, the timestamp is in days. And we can resolve individual terminals along the axon. And these terminals are only a micrometer or so in size. And it's non-invasive because, because we can image the same structures over uh, months. It's specific uh, because here, uh, this is illustrated right here, another in vivo image, uh, again, an image in the intact brain, where we've introduced two kinds of fluorophores uh, into neurons in the brain, a red fluorescent protein that labels the entire uh, the cytoplasm of the neuron, and a, a photoactivated green fluorescent protein uh, tagged to PSD95. And time zero, that green fluorescent protein was activated. Um, and uh, then the decay of the green fluorescence can be used to study protein trafficking, even in the intact brain. Um, just uh, illustrating the incredible specificity and selectivity um, of this technique. And here on the right, uh, you see another powerful application of two photon excitation microscopy. Namely, uh, it can be combined with calcium imaging. So here, uh, the neuron was labeled with uh, red calcium insensitive fluorophore and a green calcium sensitive fluorophore. Um, there are lots of dendrites in this field of view. Only one dendrite is labeled uh, with the fluorophore, and we provide a synaptic stimulus here, coincident with the blue uh, square. And you can see these calcium flashes in two dendritic spines and also calcium flash corresponding to a shaft synapse, which correspond to the synaptic activation of NMDA receptors. And this is really calcium through NMDA receptors that we image in these uh, movies. So let me give you a couple of uh, ap applications of two photon excitation microscopy. The first is uh, simply long-term imaging of neuronal structure to address the question whether or not new dendritic spines and new synapses are made um, in the adult uh, brain and whether or not new synapses are preferentially made uh, in response to novel experience. So here uh, we image a bunch of dendrites and um, a couple of axons in the somatosensory cortex of, uh, um, of, uh, of living mice. And uh, we image these dendrites every four days. So here's the timeline of the experiment. And what we found in many experiments, uh, 
previous experiments that sp most spines are stable, perhaps 70% uh, or so persist for days, weeks, and months. But other spines, in particular very thin structures like these um, uh, very thin, faint hair-like protrusions, we, some people also call them philopodia, appear and disappear over time scales of days. And, um, um, and when a new uh, dendritic spine appears, one of these philopodia-like protrusions, we could predict under baseline conditions that it's likely uh, to disappear a couple of days later. It turns out the situation is quite different uh, when we change the experience of the animal. For example, one can uh, just trim a subset of uh, whiskers and the animal has then to explore the environment with a subset of whiskers and uh, the, the cortical circuit in response free wire. So one can teach the animal, train it to do a difficult task uh, with uh, its whiskers, uh, so-called perceptual learning. In either case, what we find is that these uh, thin protrusions often are stabilized with the growth of a thick, large mushroom type spine head. And I'll illustrate that right here. So this is the uh, last image after eight day baseline period. Uh, this spine just grew uh, between, the, uh, between this and the last imaging session. And now you can see after novel experience, this dendritic spine now uh, gets a large spine head. Here's another thin protrusion that grows, philopodia-like protrusion, that also appears to be stabilized with the growth of a large uh, spine head. Let's go through this movie clip again. So here's one thin protrusion, a large spine head, another uh, thin protrusion, a large spine head, large bright spine head. Now one question you might ask is whether or not these new spines have anything to do uh, with uh, synapses. And uh, so to uh, answer that question, uh, one has to go beyond optical microscopy. This really also highlights one of the limitations of optical microscopy. It doesn't quite have the sufficient resolution to uh, resolve synapses. One has to go back to the electron micrograph, microscope and take electron microscope images and reconstruct these synapses in the surrounding neural pill. And we've done that here. So here's the 3D electron microscopy reconstruction of the spine that you just saw grow. And uh, here, blow up of this reconstruction. Here is the remnant thin protrusion and this large spine head, which is a part of a bona fide synapse and their presynaptic structures and so on that are not shown here. So using these kinds of uh, imaging experiments, we came up with uh, the following scheme uh, for changes in uh, uh, the, the following kinds of uh, scheme for uh, changes in neural networks over long time scales in the adult brain. A small population of spines appear and disappear over time scales of days. In our baseline conditions, most of these spines are subsequently uh, disassembled. But with novel experience, uh, subpopulations of these new spines is stabilized uh, uh, with an increase in spine volume and presumably a synaptic strength. And we think that it, this change this conversion from small thin spines to large mushroom spines is associated with what uh, people call long-term uh, potentiations. And I'll show you in a minute uh, in the next uh, uh, part of the talk that uh, spine size is very nicely correlated with synaptic strength and that changes in synaptic strength uh, are really tightly coupled with changes in uh, spine size.